Good morning, White Sox fans. This is your Sox Machine White Sox Wake Up Call for Wednesday, September 6, 2023. I'm Josh Nelson. It's been a terrible start for the Chris Getz era of White Sox baseball. The White Sox entered last night 0-4 since Getz was officially named the general manager, scoring a whopping five runs total in those four losses. It's been an embarrassing stretch of baseball for the White Sox who have showed little life, and last night is just another embarrassing moment for the franchise. It was a hot one in Kansas City. Despite the game starting at 6.40 p.m. Central Time, first pitch temperature was still above 90 degrees. Typically, that means the ball flies pretty far at Kauffman Stadium. After sitting down the White Sox lineup in order on just six pitches of the first inning, Royal starting pitcher Brady Sainer looked off in the second inning. Sainer's sinker velocity dropped to 91 to 90 miles per hour, and he's relying on his slider quite a bit, almost a 50-50 split with his sinker. But all of these pitches were over the heart of the home plate, and the White Sox capitalized. After Andrew Vaughn reached on an infield single that could have easily been ruled an error, Yohan Mikata blasted a middle-middle 91-mile-per-hour sinker for a 430-foot home run. Mikata's two-run shot was the sixth of the 2023 season and gave the White Sox an early lead. That wouldn't be the only home run that inning. After hard-hit singles from Elvis Andrews and Oscar Colas, rookie catcher Corey Lee benefited from a Haining slider over the middle of the plate to crush his first career home run. A 415-foot home run to left field was an absolute no-doubter, and the White Sox were ahead 5-0 in the second inning. Dylan Cease almost gave up a two-run shot to Edward Olivares, but it hit the wall for a double that put runners in scoring position with no outs. Eventually, the bases were loaded for Kansas City, but Cease escaped that jam without allowing a run. In the third inning, things didn't get better for Sainer. Now a middle-middle 92-mile-per-hour sinker to Andrew Vaughn was smacked to deep center field for a solo home run. Vaughn's 18th homer of the 2023 season sets a new single season high for him, and the 437-foot shot gave the White Sox a 6-0 lead. That would be the last time the Chicago White Sox would score in this game. Cease allowed another extra base hit to start the third inning, a triple to Michael Garcia. It would appear that Cease could get out of another jam after he struck out Bobby Wood Jr. and Elvis Andrews made a fantastic defensive play at second base, robbing Salvador Perez of a single. But MJ Melendez's liner found a hole in the White Sox defense and the White Sox lead dropped to 6-1. to one. Then Nelson Velasquez took Dylan Cease deep in the fourth inning for a solo homer, cutting the lead to 6-2. to two. Then with two outs, Michael Massey obliterated a Cease slider for a solo shot that landed into the waterfall at Kauffman Stadium. Now it was a 6-3 to three game. Then Melendez hit another home run off Cease, just a solo shot, and suddenly a six-run lead was down to 6-4. to four. Cease was just at 85 pitches entering the sixth inning as Brian Shaw began to warm up. Velasquez singled to start the inning, and in a tough battle against Drew Waters that took seven pitches, Cease struck him out on a high slider. Now at 95 pitches, Cease was trying to leave with the lead facing the Royals' bottom of the order. Nick Lofton hit a grounder right up the middle past Cease that Elvis Andrews attempted to make a diving stop. But the ball rolled under Andrews and trickled into the outfield for a single. Now with runners on first and second, Pedro Gafal decided that was enough for Cease and he called for Brian Shaw. Shaw attempted to throw out Velasquez at second base, but his throw was too high for Anderson as it deflected off his glove into center field. That throwing error moved runners up into scoring position, and a slow roller from Massey was enough for Velasquez to score from third base, making it a one-run game. Shaw did get out of the inning with the lead intact, but a six-run lead has shrunk. On 96 pitches, Cease went five and a third innings, allowed eight hits, five earned runs, two walks, seven strikeouts, and three home runs allowed. It is the fourth straight start in which Cease has allowed four or more earned runs, 46 of the 96 pitches Cease threw were sliders, which he had a 50% whiff rate, and that's good, but the Royals only whiffed on three Cease fastballs all night. That's not good, as Cease is still not back on track. It was a 6-5 game going into the bottom of the ninth inning, and this is where things get embarrassing. Gregory Santos was on the mound to close it out. On a first pitch grounder, Tim Anderson made an errant throw to put pressure on Santos as his throw was way high over Andrew Vaughn's head. 
Massey would single to left field, and all of a sudden, with no outs, the Royals had the winning run on first base. Michael Garcia hit a slow chopper at Yohan Makata. Makata had enough time to make a strong throw to second base, but Elvis Andrews' return throw to first base wasn't in time. So now you got runners on the corners with just one out and Bobby Witt Jr. at the plate. And Witt Jr. came through with a big double down the right field line. So runners are in scoring position with just one out. The game is tied 6-6. Six to six. Salvador Perez was batting. Perez hit another line drive, and just like earlier in the game, he was robbed when Tim Anderson made the snag with the infield drawn in. Uh, of course, Anderson makes that defensive play, but he couldn't make the one earlier. There's two outs, and Pedro Grafal called for the intentional walk of MJ Melendez to load the bases for Oliveras. Melendez is a left-handed hitter, and Grafal's trying to play the percentages here, trying to have the platoon advantage. In the dumbest way possible to lose a game, Santos tried to quick pitch Oliveras, but he never came set. So he was called for a balk by the home plate umpire. The Royals pulled the come from behind victory and the White Sox lose 7-6 because of a balk off. I would say this is embarrassing, and I have said it's embarrassing, but it's been nothing but embarrassing for this White Sox organization since last Thursday, and I am running out of words on how to describe what has happened in the last two weeks to the Chicago White Sox. But just the last night's game is just another example of a facepalm type of performance and in what has become the dumbest White Sox season ever. There's no I in team, but there is one in Indeed, and that's the hiring platform that you need to build yours. When you're hiring, you need Indeed. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed's a powerful hiring platform that can help you do it all. One of the things I love about Indeed is that it makes hiring all in one place so easy because Indeed does the hard work for you. They show you the candidates whose resumes on Indeed fit your description immediately after you post so you can hire faster. Join more than 3 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash sports. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash sports. That's Indeed.com slash sports. And support the show by saying that you heard it on this podcast. Indeed.com slash sports. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. It's another night game as the White Sox and Royals conclude their last game against each other at Kauffman Stadium in 2023. Tuki Tucson will start for the White Sox and Jordan Lyles will get the ball for Kansas City. Tucson has pitched all right for the White Sox in back-to-back -back appearances. He pitched five scoreless innings against Oakland on August 26th and went five and a third innings, allowing three runs against Detroit on September 1st. The White Sox are keeping Tucson around 95 pitches per start, so we'll see if he can get deeper into this contest. The walk total is going to be key. In his last start against Detroit, Tucson only walked two batters, but that was the fewest he allowed since late July. Nobody for the Royals has faced Tucson before, so it'll be a learning experience for both sides. Lyles is having a tough season. He's 4-15 on the year with a 6.29 ERA. He last faced the White Sox back in May 20th when the White Sox scored five runs off Lyles on their way to a 5-1 victory. First pitch is at 6.40 p.m. Central Time, and you can watch on NBC Sports Chicago or listen on ESPN 1000 AM. Down on the farm, the Charlotte Knights and Durham Bulls engaged in a slugfest. The Bulls were up 7-2 at one point, but the Charlotte Knights mounted a comeback to tie the game in the seventh inning thanks to a two-run homer from Xavier Fernandez. However, the Bulls scored in the eighth inning and held off the Knights for an 8-7 victory. Gilbert Sanchez, Victor Reyes, and Fernandez all had multi-hit games. Clint Frazier hit a home run, and Christian Mena went five innings, allowed 11 hits, seven earned runs. He walked one. He did have seven strikeouts, though, on 87 pitches. In Birmingham, Matthew Thompson was quite good. On 84 pitches, Thompson went six innings, allowed just three hits, one earned run, walking three, and striking out eight lowering his season ERA down to 4.59. But the Biloxi Shuckers had a field day against the Barons' bullpen as they scored four runs in the seventh inning 
to make it a five-run lead off a reliever Halen Green. The Shuckers were up 9 to nothing before Colson Montgomery pulled a 91-mile-per-hour fastball for a home run. That's Montgomery's third home run in double-A, and that was the only run scored by the Barons on the night. Winston-Salem visited Hickory, where Norhe Vera got the start. It wasn't a great one, as Vera went three to third innings, allowed five hits, three runs, two earned, walked two, and struck out five on 62 pitches. Andrew Dahlquist out of the bullpen went two and two-thirds innings, allowed three hits, one earned run, didn't walk a batter, and he struck out two. Catcher Michael Turner was three for four, and shortstop Brooks Baldwin was two for three with an RBI, but the Dash lost four to three as they dropped to 60 and 62 in the Sally League. Kannapolis was also on the road, and they won big against Lynchburg, 7-0. Honecker Bencourt hit a three-run homer as the Ole Miss duo of Jacob Gonzalez and Calvin Harris both went 1-4 for four with an RBI. <laughs> Around Major League Baseball, Jose Altuve became the fourth player in Major League Baseball history to start a game with three home runs in the first three innings of a game against the Texas Rangers. Nathan Eovaldi made the start, his first in a while because of injury. And the Astros gave him a rude welcome back, scoring nine runs of the first three innings to win a laugher. Houston now leads the American League West. More on that later. Cleveland had a 3-2 lead against the Minnesota Twins after the fifth inning, but the Guardians' bullpen collapsed as the Twins won 8-3. Minnesota now has a seven-game lead over Cleveland with 23 games left. You can do the math. Jake Berger hit his 31st home run of the season to help power a comeback win for the Miami Marlins as they scored three runs at the bottom of the eighth inning to surprise the Los Angeles Dodgers 6-3. That also happened in Cincinnati. Julio Rodriguez homered again for Seattle as they were leading 6-3 heading into the eighth inning, but the Reds scored three runs at the bottom of the eighth to tie the game. And then in the bottom of the ninth inning, Ellie De La Cruz singled and stole second base and scored the game-winning run thanks to the walk-off single from Christian Encarnacion Strand. So Seattle is one game back at Houston in the American League West while the Rangers fall back to two games and they are in third place in the American League West. San Francisco is up 3 to nothing before the Chicago Cubs scored four runs in the third inning thanks to a two-run double from Jan Gomes. Then the Giants roared back. They scored three runs in the sixth inning, capped by a two-run shot from J.D. Davis. In the seventh inning, Seiya Suzuki hit a two-run homer to tie the game again. After some Nick Magical magic, Christopher Morrell blasted a three-run shot to give the Cubs a 10-6 lead. Eventually, the Cubs would win 11-8, but the Milwaukee Brewers beat the Pittsburgh Pirates 7-3 last night, so no ground made up in the National League Central for the Cubbies. That will do it for this White Sox wake-up call. You can follow us on Twitter. We're at Sox Machine. You can follow me on Twitter at Sox Machine underscore Josh. Subscribe to the Sox Machine podcast wherever you listen to podcasts such as Spotify and Apple Music. We also upload podcast episodes into our YouTube channel, which please subscribe to at YouTube.com slash Sox Machine. If you enjoy our work and want more, you can get more by subscribing to our Patreon to receive exclusive content and ad-free versions of the website and podcasts. Monthly plans start at $2, or you can save with an annual subscription. Again, sign up at patreon.com slash Sox Machine. The White Sox Wake Up Call is a production of SoxMachine.com. You're on for all things Chicago White Sox baseball and part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Josh Nelson. Thanks for listening. <laughs>